So there are some very famous performance pieces that were done, particularly when performance art was really emerging as something that uh, was, was startling people. That you can only see the photographs now because someone happened to have a camera or a, or a video camera on the spot. When you're a curator at a performance uh, 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 exhibit, you may actually have to get permission from that artist to be able to photograph or film it. So people who could not be physically present still can enjoy that work of art. But it's ephemeral, that it has a very limited lifespan based beyond the way that we record it. So even today, this is ephemeral. However, I've transcended the ephemeral with this headset as well as I have a backup of an audio recorder. So when you're curating performance, this may be some of the considerations that you need to know. This means you need to know technology, too. And what is the best means to capture what it is that you need to capture. The roles have been changing, though, as a result of, uh, in particular, um, not only the, the diversification of curatorial responsibilities, but also economics, too. So curators have been expected to, be, to do more administrative as well as developmental work, which includes fundraising. And this is why it's so important to have an awareness of what you have in the collection, the importance of that collection, but also to be aware of what's going on not only in your city, your state, the country, your hemisphere, the world. Because how is it, if, you, if there's an exhibit that you want to present to the public, how do you make this an important part of a larger picture? And then in order to do this, you need money. So it, it's also an awareness of various corporations as, and other organizations that are willing to donate money. And that includes individuals who are willing to donate money for this to happen. So the range of tasks is going to vary from organization to organization that you are expected uh, to fulfill. And this holds true even for your independent curator. Right? I mentioned on uh, Monday there are people who do nothing but curation, and they do an exhibit in one museum, and as soon as they're done with that one, they might get two weeks off, and they're on another run in another museum in another part of the country or another part of the world. So it's important then to be able to assess the needs, not only of the institution, but the community in which that institution resides. Because you want whatever you are presenting to be socially, culturally relevant to that community or to a global community. So you have to be able to express the idea that you have or ideas that you have about your collection and objects and be able to think in your mind how you would present it in a way that makes people want to come. Anyone can put objects out there. Getting people to come to look at them is an entirely different set of ideas. So you also need to be able to organize as well as implement that presentation that's going to represent not only the artists and the art, but your institution that is sponsoring this. You are a mediator, a go-between, someone who is very critically aware of your institutional needs, your institutional agenda, but you're also making sure that the artists that you are approaching are going to be taken care of within that context so that there is a minimum amount of conflict between the artist and the institution because that is evident to a public eye. And that's one thing we don't want to do is bring ugly to the public. We want people to learn. So you don't want to air laundry between the artist and the institution if there is conflict. You want to mediate it and find ways that everyone can work together. So in many ways, as a curator, you're also a diplomat. So you're balancing the institutional as well as the artist needs, and yes, even your employment, your job.
you are responsible for access, that you are providing professional as well as public access to the various project ideas and the art that is representative of those ideas. You're organizing the exhibit or the project itself. You might be writing various texts uh, for not only a, uh, the curatorial, or didactic means that there are, you're presenting op opposing viewpoints or, or at least two viewpoints as people look at an object, as well as promotion. And you're also organizing public events, which include openings, but it may be artist lectures. It may be family days that you're, you're assisting in that. And the various texts and part of what we're going to be doing in this class, based on our research, and your project, you'll be writing labels for the objects that you will select. And it starts there. Because you might say the label is a microcosm of what's going to be a larger catalog. Along with that catalog, though, is a curatorial statement. What is the rationale? Why is this selection of objects important, not only to the museum, but to the history of a given town, reservation, or a country. Your curatorial statement. Why is this important? So you'll be going right from the very micro of labels assembled into a catalog, introduced with a curatorial statement. Now, your project is only going to consist of an assembly of anywhere from, uh, I guess it's uh, five to seven or eight objects. We're going to keep it small, rather than have you do a whole gallery. And what we'll do as part of the planning is we'll use, and it's, a, it's actually a relatively simple space to work within, is the Primitive Edge Gallery. So you'll be planning how you would uh, display those objects hypothetically within that space. So you'll all get a floor plan. You'll all get a part of that gallery um, in which to uh, mount or hang the objects that you select. And the objects, too, are going to be, be consistent of uh, photographs as well as two or three dimensional objects beyond photography. So you'll be accessing our archives and photography, but also when we're talking with Tatiana, you won't actually be taking the objects out of, uh, out of our storage. But you will obtain permission to look at them and then assess them. And then we have images of all those objects that you would use as part of your planning. So you would write your labels based on the image you have rather than going in and handling, for example, a dandeming a painting. So you're going to be doing a good amount of research as well as a good amount of writing. But once again, this process prepares you to be able to curate another exhibit in many other contexts, having gone through it in this class. That's why it's important to start looking at that curatorial toolkit. Because by the end of the term, you're also going to be writing, uh, and although at this point it may not be as, uh, um, as uh, packed as, say, um, Patsy Phillips's curriculum. Data, in essence, is the history of all of the, not only your education, but your publications, the exhibits that you've participated in or mounted, where you've worked, uh, important shows you've been involved in. All right, hers is pretty long, but she's been around a while. So yours may not be as long. It doesn't matter. Because putting together a VITA, whether it be for Obama, is going to be the same process as putting a, together a VITA for Judith. You're going to have the same considerations. The cool thing about the VITA is once you start it, you just recycle it. All right, you don't unexperience yourself. So as you move throughout your life, you hang on to that document, and then you just add chronologically to the things you've done. All right, so once you've started it, you've got it. Because a vita is different than a resume. 
You're also making informed decisions. That means you have to be constantly educating yourself through the various publications and networks that are out there about creative practices, not only of artists, but of curators and museums. What are bold, new, and innovative ways that collections are being presented in a wide range of formats? That means that you have to be constantly surveying about what's being produced and exhibited not only by artists, but curators as well as uh, um, the various institutions. Now we have a pretty good collection of exhibition catalogs and books here. There are also a good number of catalogs and exhibitions online. Some of them you have to pay for, some of them are available that you can view for free. If nothing else, you can go to museum websites and see, so you can go to MoMA right now and see what's being featured. And then reading the local, national, as well as international periodicals about curatorial practice and museum practice. And it doesn't hurt now even to start become, uh, to become involved with the various professional networks and the social networks that are out there. So now Facebook kinds of be like, it tends to be friendly spam. All right, it's uh, a lot of spam out there on Facebook, just crap, you know, people just putting crap up there. I've decided I'm not gonna, I, I have used Facebook. I've decided I'm gonna put thoughtful stuff on Facebook. I'm tired of spam. But there are other social networks, such as LinkedIn. So they relate directly to connecting yourself with other professionals. It allows you to be able to communicate in dang near real time. 